In Colombia, four years after what became known as the Tandil Massacre, the families of the victims and civil society organizations are demanding justice. Nearly three terabytes of data on the wealthy elite of over 200 countries and territories have been leaked in what has been termed the Pandora Papers. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who was sworn in for a second five-term year, fought bowing to defend Ethiopia's honor despite mounting global criticism over the war in the northern Tigray region. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your host, Gladys Quesada, and now we begin with the news in Colombia, where victims of state violence rallied in front of the Constitutional Court, demanding that the ordinary judicial system take over the investigation into the massacre that occurred four years ago in Tandil, Nariño Department, which is under investigation by the military justice system. Impunity reigns regarding the crime, in which members of the Colombian Army and the anti-narcotics police were allegedly implicated. We have more in the following report. They requested that the Constitutional Court rule upon the jurisdiction challenge so that the investigation of the massacre in the village of El Tandil in Tumaco municipality, Nariño department, does not proceed in the military justice system and instead is handled by the ordinary judicial system since those responsible for this event are police officers and members of the Colombian Army. The prosecutor office stated that it could not find any evidence to support the version of the security forces that it has been an attack by dissidents. Rather than, in fact, the prosecutor office agreed with the version of the victims that it has been an indiscriminate attack on unarmed people. However, since the case was transferred to the military criminal justice system, we find ourselves in a deadlock. With posters on the walls of the courthouse, protesters revealed what happened on October the 5th, 2017, when 1,500 farmers protested in the village of El Tandil against a forceful and violent crop eradication program carried out by the anti-narcotic police and the Colombian army. Some of the 600 armed men opened fire against the coca farmers, workers and members of the farmers' associations that were gathered there. Our intentions were to change the illicit crops for food, and I can't believe that in the midst of the peace process on trying to negotiate, trying to negotiate with the very government, we were shot at, killing seven comrades, more than 20 wounded, leaving orphaned children, leaving single mothers, leaving a number of disabled. That's my case because I was shot twice in my left arm, and there was total displacement from that area. This was the first massacre after the peace agreements signed in 2016, which provided for the full substitution of illicit crops with sustainable productive projects. However, the government of Ivan Duque did not heed the call of the farmers and their families and continued with the violent crop eradication program, attacking the weakest link in the production chain. Coca for us, they say it is an illicit crop, but for us it is not illicit, it is illicit, because we subsist there thanks to coca. There are no schools, there is no health post, there are no roads, there is absolutely no help. So what is happening is that we want the government to comply with the peace agreements. Since 2016 to date, more than 210 massacres have been reported in Colombia of which 75 have taken place so far this year. The most recent occurred in the municipality of Anodi, department of Antioquia, on October the 2nd, where four people were killed, including a minor. To date, it is unknown which armed group is behind this violent incident. Now we continue. The Venezuelan government announced reopening of the border with Colombia as of Tuesday to allow for the resumption of binational trade under a strict protocol to prevent the spread of COVID-19. 
As part of the border reopening process, Vice President Delcy Rodriguez authorized the removal of the containers that had restricted access to the Simón Bolívar International Bridge that connects the two countries. The Vice President ratified the political will of the government to ensure the reopening benefits both nations, stressing the decision was made given the importance of trade between the two countries, estimated at more than $7 billion. She also highlighted that the Colombian government needs to control the activities of paramilitary groups, drug trafficking and criminal gangs, which have affected border areas. But in spite of this, in spite of what the plan while And we'll be right. But in spite of this, in spite of what the plan violence against our homeland has met, President Nicolás Maduro always thinking of our people, thinking in terms of brotherhood. The cooperation between the people of Colombia and the people of Venezuela has made the decision to open the crossing to binational trade. This is very important news. Historically, the commercial exchange between Colombia and Venezuela has exceeded $7 billion. So this is a very direct message to the productive forces of Colombia, of Venezuela, to trade and binational actors. And we'll be right back after this very short break. So don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. On Sunday, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalism revealed they had compiled and analyzed nearly three terabytes of data on the wealthy elite of over 200 countries and territories compiled from 11.9 million records and 14 different offshore services firms. The Pandora Papers includes 332 politicians, 134 billionaires, celebrities, fraudsters, drug dealers, royal family members, leaders of religious groups around the world, and the alarming but not surprising figure of 35 current and former country leaders. Among them, the presidents of Ukraine, Kenya, and the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, as well as former British Prime Minister Tony Blair. A prior project, the Panama Papers, revealed similar information, but this time the data compiling goes back to the 1970s, and a large part comprehends 1996 to 2020 operations. According to the research team, the list states and properties are not necessarily illegal, but its tax value was significantly downplayed to evade about $11.3 trillion in payments. The assets from luxury items such as property and yacht, as well as incognito bank accounts, art ranging from looted Cambodian antiquities to paintings by Picasso and murals by Banksy, were hidden in tax havens listed like Panama, Dubai, Monaco, Switzerland, and the Cayman Islands. Out of the 35 presidents involved in the matter, 14 are Latin American, as the list includes heads of states as Ecuador's Guillermo Lasso, Chile's Sebastian Piñera, and Dominican Republic's Luis Abinader. These inner workings reveal an under the shadows economy that controls the common. So maybe we should not say tax the rich, but justice for the poor. Now we remain on topic. Latin American presidents and former heads of state have already issued statements seeking to disassociate themselves from the revelations of the Pandora Papers that link to their personal and family finances. The Chilean government issued a communique stating that the investigation into the sale of the Dominga Mining Company found no crime had been committed and that President Sebastián Piñera never participated in the operation. Meanwhile, the government of the Dominican Republic emphasized that President Luis Abinader has been transparent before his country and recalled that in his sworn statement of assets, he includes his family's offshore companies, which are managed under a trust. Ecuador's President Guillermo 
Basso argued that he had not only collaborated with the investigation, but that he has also complied with his tax obligations in Ecuador. And former president of Colombia, Cesar Gaviria, admitted that he did have a stake in an offshore company in Panama, which has been declared to the National Tax and Customs Department in accordance with the requirements of Colombian law. Brazil's finance minister, Paulo Guedes, is one of the names featured in the Pandora Papers, which show he is personally benefiting from the policies he is implementing in the country. Our correspondent, Brian Mir, has the details. Brazil's finance minister, Paulo Guedes, is one of the original Chicago boys. He studied under neoliberal guru Milton Friedman at University of Chicago in the 1970s and is considered to be one of the most mediocre of his students. He was never able to publish his dissertation, even in Portuguese. Since he's taken office, he's continued the deep austerity measures that started after the 2016 coup, and he's implemented policies that have weakened the Brazilian real against the dollar. Now it's come out in the Pandora's papers that he's benefiting personally from these policies because he's got millions of dollars in holdings in the British Virgin Islands in a company that he created in 2014. He didn't declare his assets when he took office. And there's records that on a single day two years ago, he deposited $9.55 million into this account. So as long as the Brazilian real keeps going down, his assets continue to increase. This has got a lot of Brazilian people calling for his resignation. Meanwhile, the Brazilian hegemonic media is buffering him from the crisis. They're just talking about Shakira and Tony Blair and some of the celebrities that have been tied up in Pandora Papers, but they're not mentioning Paulo Guedes, showing once again that Brazilian elites may be upset with Jair Bolsonaro, but they want to continue the deep austerity cuts. They want to continue privatizing Brazil's assets at pennies on the dollar to international capital interests. In the meantime, Paulo Guedes is coming under investigation. The opposition in Congress is starting an investigation into conflict of interest related to his offshore holdings in the British Virgin Islands. Thank you, Brian, for this report. Now we move on. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador has welcomed the revelations stemming from the Pandora Papers leak, which include data on more than 3,000 Mexicans who allegedly hid assets in tax havens to evade taxes. This is being made transparent and that the relevant authorities will act if there are crimes to be prosecuted. The origin of the money should also be clarified because there are businessmen, politicians, legislators from Mexico and all over the world. In the wake of the Pandora Papers revelations, the European Union chief has said the bloc must do more to combat tax evasion and aggressive tax planning. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen on Monday condemned the practices brought to light in the huge data leak, which detailed how 35 current and former world leaders have used offshore tax havens to t stash assets worth hundreds of millions of dollars. She said the practice was unacceptable, while at the same time claiming that the European Union has some of the highest tax transparency standards in the world. The revelations are embarrassing for leaders who have pushed austerity measures or campaigned against corruption. Among those featuring in the leaked papers is former EU Commissioner and Maltese Minister John Daly, accused of failing to declare a secret offshore company while a member of parliament. Daly resigned as EU Health Commissioner in 2012 over a bribery scandal. Minister of Finland and President of the European Commission. And the subject of this press conference is Finland's recovery and resilience. Good afternoon. One question to the President uh, of the European Commission. Is it possible that the recovery and resilience plan or a similar program will be re-implemented in the future? Prime Minister of Finland and President of the European Commission. And the subject of this press conference is Finland's recovery and resilience. Iltalehti. Good afternoon. One question to the President uh, of the European Commission. Is it possible that the recovery and resilience plan or a similar program will be re-implemented in the future? 
and we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed was sworn in for a second five-year term on Monday, vowing to stand strong and defend Ethiopia's honor, despite mounting global criticism over the war in the northern Tigray region. Abiy's prosperity party scored a landslide win in June elections, which came despite the ongoing conflict in Tigray, with allegations of human rights abuses, tens of thousands killed, and hundreds of thousands facing famine-like conditions, according to the United Nations. The fighting was spread to the neighboring Afar and Amhara regions, while Tigray has fallen under what the UN describes as the de facto humanitarian blockade. It is unclear whether Abiy's swearing in will alter the course of the war between governments government troops and the Tigray's People Liberation Front, which dominated the national politics before he took power. Abiy's office has said certain conciliatory measures, such as declassifying the front as a terrorist group, could only happen after a new government was formed. A United Nations investigation published on Monday stated that war crimes and crimes against humanity have been committed in Libya since 2016. In June 2020, the UN Human Rights Council adopted a resolution calling for a fact-finding mission to be sent to Libya. The experts were charged with investigating alleged violations and abuses of international human rights and humanitarian law since 2016. Despite the release of the report on Monday citing widespread abuses by all parties to the conflict in the country, the mission experts said more time is needed to probe further allegations on the direct participation of children in hostilities. As well as documenting the recruitment of child soldiers, the report details the enforced disappearance and extrajudicial killings of prominent women. All rich Libya has been torn by conflict since the 2011 NATO-led invasion and the toppling and assassination of longtime leader Muammar Gaddafi, with rival groups vying for power. Our investigations have established that all parties to the conflicts, including third state, foreign fighters and mercenaries, have violated international humanitarian law, in particular the principle of proportionality and distinction. And some have also committed war crime. Civilians paid a heavy price during the 2019-2020 hostilities in Tripoli, as well as during other armed confrontations in the country since 2016. Meanwhile, people seeking to cross the Mediterranean Sea to Europe are subjected to a huge number of abuses in detention centers and at the hands of traffickers, according to the United Nations fact-finding mission in Libya. Despite reports of the abuses, the European Union continues to funnel millions of euros into Libya to get authorities there to prevent people reaching its shores. Our investigations also indicated that migrants, asylum seekers and refugees are subjected to a litany of abuses at sea, in detention centers, and at the hands of traffickers. Violations against migrants are committed on a widespread scale by state and non-state actors with a high level of organization and with encouragement of the state. All of this is suggestive of crimes against humanity. Our investigations also indicated that migrants, asylum seekers, and refugees are subjected to a litany of abuses at sea, in detention centers, and at the hands of traffickers. Violations against migrants are committed on a widespread scale by state and non-state actors with a high level of organization and with encouragement of the state. All of this is suggestive of crimes against humanity. Our investigation... Now we address other topics. Authorities in the former capital of Senegal are immersed in a battle against the rising sea, which threatens to wash the city away.
The city of St. Louis served as the capital of the French colony of Senegal until the capital moved to the car shortly before Senegal's independence in 1960. Its colorful, historic balcony houses and double-storied villas have helped make the island a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the city hosts a renowned annual jazz festival. But St. Louis stands only a few meters above the sea metal level, I beg your pardon, and climate change is already wrecking havoc. Excavators are currently ripping up its beach to lay giant blocks of basalt in a last-minute effort to keep the sea at bay. When f the work is finished, a black sea wall will stretch for kilometers along the coastline. But the sea wall is a stopgap, and some are skeptical that the historic city can be saved at all. This damn construction project came too late. There is no point in playing doctor after death. They waited for billions of CFA francs to be swallowed up by the sea before coming today to put these stones. Life here is an ordeal. Our new lodgings are extremely hot and we live there with our whole family as we have no choice. We have to stay here because our home was totally destroyed by the sea. The aim is to gain at least 20 meters of coastline and thereby free up to 20 meters of houses, starting from the protective wall and then to have 4 meters that will be reforested and left to the inhabitants for recreational activities, but which will not be inhabited. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres visited Barbados to address the 15th session of the UN Conference on Trade and Development, which begins this Monday, under the theme From Inequality and Vulnerability to Prosperity for All. The following video sums up his visit to the Caribbean island nation. This visit is a visit of solidarity. And that solidarity is entirely justified because uh, these countries, and Barbados in the first line, are the main victims of the inequality that prevails in the world. And here we see what Barbados is doing, protecting the coastline because of the rising sea waters. But of course, small countries, small island countries all around the world cannot do it without much more support. To build resilience to prepare the land and the people for the devastating impact of climate change. Had we not done this coastal protection, all of this land going back to the buildings behind would be literally being reclaimed now. Regrettably, we expect worse. If the youth are the future, it is our duty to protect them as much as we can. We need to include the future in the decisions that we take today. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.